that I was given to talk about this morning was inclusion. And again, I said I do a lot of corporate work. I've done you know whole days of training on inclusive leadership and what that means. And it's such a nice little sanitized word, right? Like kumbaya, we all get along, everyone's included. It sounds great. I think it's such an important topic right now, though, because it is the opposite of what we're seeing in the national conversation, the really divisive rhetoric and hate mongering and fear mongering about people that are different than us. For the last 10 years, we've been doing this nice inclusiveness training, you know, it's like it's become urgent now. It's, we need a counterweight. You know, there are forces trying to pull us all apart and inclusion is, you know, really serious work we need to be doing. So I was excited that you made that the theme. One of the hardest things that I ever did I was going back to the hospital where I had my leg amputated in Los Angeles. And I had gone to a lot of hospitals to visit children and show my medals and sign autographs and things. But to go back to that hospital, which I had been in and out of from the time I was five to the time I was 18. It's a children's hospital, so you max out at 18. So I hadn't been back for decades to that hospital. I was invited to go and speak to a group of teenagers in the hospital and their parents were there with them too. Just walking in the front door, you know, after decades of being away was like time travel back to one of the hardest times in your life. There were times after surgeries, I couldn't sleep at night, I was in so much pain. I had to learn how to walk all over again with my new artificial leg and go through painful therapy. And at the time when I was younger, because I'm older than I look, I've been told, um, at the time, hospitals were not very kid friendly. You know, I would spend my parents were only allowed to come and see me once a week. And I, my brother and sister were never allowed to come upstairs. So I was on the third floor and I would look down and I was in there as long as six months. You know? So it, just, it was a very hard time in my life to remember back to. So you know, I'm going in the hospital and there's like waves of emotion you know, going over me. And I go upstairs to where the kids are. And there was actually a shot of it in the video. And you can see the kids, you know, wheelchairs, gurneys, tubes, uh, you know, everything. It looks like a war zone. And looking around at those kids, you realize that's why you have to go back. It is a war zone. You don't leave people behind in a war zone. You go back. And for me, it's time travel into the past. For them, it's time travel into the future, right? To see somebody who is in the same bed you are, you're in now, who is able to, you know, have a career, wear a suit, have a family, you know, do all those things. It's so important to give them that vision of who they can be. So I give my speech, I talk about Harvard and ski racing and all these things. And at the end, there's a woman all the way in the back. And I don't think English was her first language. And she was sitting next to her son. And her son was badly burnt. He had scars on like 70% of his body. And she leans forward and she says, Bonnie, will my son lead a normal life? You know, she wanted one word from me in that moment. And I froze up and I couldn't, you know like an out of body experience? Have you ever had an out of mouth experience, right? So in that moment she said, will my son lead a normal life? And I said, no, aim higher, aim higher. I got to do this Oprah Magazine uh, fashion shoot. It's so fun, it was like sequin skirt, the necklace weighed five pounds, the shoes I cannot even begin to walk in, but it was really cool to do the photo. It says, I don't hide my leg, I show it off. Looking normal is overrated. And that message, that was a hard one message for me personally. I spent so much of my early life striving to be normal, trying, I just thought if I could be like other kids. And I, and I, I have to say, looking back, in my head, normal and perfect was confused. I remember being in the, in the backyard playing soccer with my brother, just kicking a soccer ball around, and I was so frustrated because I can't stand on this leg very well. So I would stand on this leg and kick with my fake leg, and I couldn't make the ball go where I wanted it to go. And I said, Wayne, I have a rubber foot. You know, like, I can't make it go. And he goes, Bonnie, nobody can make the ball go exactly where they want to go. You know, and I thought if you had two feet, you could do it perfectly, right? So I spent so much of my life striving to be normal, thinking that that was perfect. Um, my mom, too, to protect me, used to cover up my leg and you know, she'd say, Bonnie, stop hopping around the house. What's your leg on? <laughs> she wanted me to be more normal. You know, I got so many messages about being normal. And it took me a long time to let that go and say, what's so great about being normal? You know, normal is average. Normal is be extraordinary. 
And you can be unusual, you can be extraordinary, you can be whoever you are and be unique and really embrace that and be extraordinary. And so that's part of the message of inclusion too, is if you're more part of the mainstream, you don't realize how much pressure other people feel to try to fit in. I've been working with multicultural women in corporate America and it's interesting. I just went through a nine month program, leading people through a nine month program. And so much of it at the end was the realization that they had been shortchanging their careers because they were trying so hard to blend in that they were anonymous. You don't always realize how much pressure there is to fit in and be normal. I mean, and you know for your kids that that pressure is incredible. So, so part of inclusion is really embracing differences and helping people see extraordinary as different. I'm an optimist about inclusion. This is a picture of Barbara Warmath, who was the person who invited me to go skiing for the first time. A lot of people ask, you know, how does a one-legged black girl from San Diego end up being a ski racer? So the answer is Barbara Warmath. She invited me to go skiing over Christmas vacation with her family. I remember she got a piece of notebook paper and like cut out a little certificate and wrote a certificate coupon for one week of skiing over. My birthday is November, and so she gave it to me in November. I had to go out and find the special equipment. I had to. Um, I, let's see, I got a, a pair of ski pants from the Salvation Army in a really scary color. And then uh, I found they didn't have a jacket, so I went to Kmart and I got a jacket. And amazingly, it was in the same scary color as the pants. <laughs> so I got myself ready and I, I went with Barbara Warmath and it was so hard. I fell and I fell, I fell. I ran into her mother years later at Park City, Utah, actually, and she said, I'm sorry. I'm like, what? You took me skiing for the first time? You know, it changed my life. She goes, I know, but at the end of that first week of skiing, I tried to talk you out of ever doing it again. You were so bruised and bleeding, and you know, I said swimming is a nice sport. You know. <laughs> but uh, Barbara Warmouth is amazing. When you think about that in high school, so you know, you guys have kids. Some of you have kids in elementary, high school. In high school, she turned to her one-legged black friend from the wrong side of the tracks. She lived in La Jolla in San Diego. Those of you who know that. I lived in National City, which is where the gangs are and the drugs, and I was bussed across town into her school. She turned to her one-legged black friend from the wrong side of the tracks and said, skier. <laughs> That's amazing. She is an amazing person. She, um, she went to the Peace Corps after. Um, I ran into her. I, I went to see her and her family, uh, and they were in, living in a refugee camp, working in the refugee camp to resettle refugees to help them get acclimated to America. I mean, she's an amazing person. And I said to her, you know, I said I was talking to her kids too, and I said, "Your mom changed my life," and she's like, I, "I don't understand what the big deal is." She's just that kind of person that reaches out across differences and sees possibilities. Again, we're talking about choosing to be extraordinary in your own way. You know, that's Barbara Warmath. She she said, "I knew you could do it." The interesting thing, and again, in corporate America, we talk a lot about inclusion and diversity being a source of competitiveness. It's innovation. It's good. It makes us all stronger. So I was thinking about this story recently and I realized our team was more competitive because I was on it. Had I not been on it, we wouldn't have won as many medals that year. The other, you know, the people who were uh, behind me who were, uh, who I was second overall, so the person who was third overall was Canadian. Um, and then in the other races I was in, anyway, we, if I hadn't been there, other countries would have won, not us. And so literally it made us more competitive to have me on the team. But who, the US team would not be in San Diego recruiting black girls, you know? Like, really. So, it, it, again, it's that, that her ability to recruit outside the norm made us stronger. So, it's just it's an absolute example of that.